I don't think I've ever been this impressed and disappointed by a movie before. The fights are good, the choreography is awesome, the visuals and the lighting and locations are stunning, the VFX impeccable, cinematography top notch, the acting is great, I'm in love with the tone and the atmosphere, the characters all look the part, the costumes are superb, excellent, outstanding. So why do I still feel this way? It's very strange for your intellect to be telling you one thing and your emotions to be telling you something completely different. So this is the power of the human nature jutsu. Dune part one kind of left a lot of people feeling the same way. Simply slapping the word disappointed on a thumbnail was enough to make people migrate there en masse to express their displeasure with it. And while I quite enjoyed part one, I also somewhat felt that it was unfulfilled. And I think I finally figured out why. I was initially thinking it's a classic case of telling not showing, but it's worse than that. These movies take the mistake to a whole new level by not showing and not telling either. Characters have very few lines in this. Obviously not Paul or Jessica, we spend a lot of time with them, but a big chunk of the cast doesn't really do much or say much. After seeing part one, I was very intrigued to meet the Emperor and to hear his perspective, see what his world is like, to peer into his mind, hear his rationale. He has three lines in this. Christopher Walken doesn't look like he's in the middle of a scene, he looks like he's pacing in between takes, cause that's what he does most of the time, and then he reads aloud the homework of the world's laziest second grader, the end. The Baron, same thing. The Reverend Mother, same thing. She has two lines and some expository dialogue. The Princess, she's really cool. Like the actress, the costumes, the swagger, doesn't get to do much. Everyone's just standing on ceremony, waiting for the plot to happen to them. And part of the problem is the structure of the story, because characters are far removed from one another. The characters that have the most friction and would therefore be most interesting to pit together, have to spend 98% of the runtime separated and have the measliest of interactions for the remaining 2%. That's probably not the film's fault so much as it is the book's fault, but it then should be the film's job to write original scenes that attempt to solve this problem a little bit. Extended dialogue scenes, messages back and forth, dreams, visions, all of these tools could be employed to bring the pantheon of characters a little more together and give them a little bit more to do. I guess this is why everyone says that the book is unadaptable because everything there is just monologue, 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 and you simply can't do that in a film, so you have to pull something else out of your ass. In Dune Part 1, we are told that Leto and Jessica have a loving relationship, but there's no time to develop it. We're told about the Harkin and Atreides rivalry, about the political situation, the other houses, but we're not shown much of it. In fact, we're straight up told the plot of the movie before it happens, and then it happens. Yeah, I know this is the structure of the book, but this isn't a book, is it? Characters don't talk much, and then they die. And in Part 2, characters somehow talk even less and then they die. There's this 10 second scene where Anya Taylor-Joy is introduced and then never appears again. And that's a good microcosm for the problem that plagues this entire film. Characters exist and then something happens and the movie ends. They're established, they wait. Wait, wait Robert, we'll get to you. We'll get to you, you gotta warm up. <gasps> Ammonia cap? <sighs> ah! Yeah, I control the control, control. Oh. It's like the scriptwriters were concerned and thought that maybe this scene could use an extra page of dialogue and how they could squeeze an extra line here or there. And Denis was like, yeah, 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 never mind that. Check out this cool wide shot. I think the main mismatch here is that this is supposed to be a wordy film. It's a film about politics and persuasion, manipulation, religious propaganda, you know, Game of Thrones in space. There are hundreds of compelling evergreen dialogue scenes from Game of Thrones that I can point to in spite of its shit ass finale. There are barely any such examples I can highlight in Dune. Which is not to say the writing is bad, there's just not a lot of it. It just feels like they used alphabet pasta to carefully assemble the script, and then after they left, the clueless janitor came in, broom in hand, and swept most of it away. And there are revelations in this that sound like they should matter, but they don't look like they do, because it doesn't seem to affect the characters that much in the end, like Paul's bloodline. And speaking of not mattering, I know what the ultimate point of the book is, I'm not so sure I get what the ultimate point of this movie is. Well, what do you mean? It's the same as the book. As if, why is, um, is it though? This whole thing felt inevitable, so I'm not sure what the moral of the story is supposed to be. Without giving much away, in the book, Paul drinks that piss of life thing out of a misguided attempt to gain more power. It's his choice, informed by maybe not the best rationale. Here, it's framed as if he has no choice. All of this is framed as if no one has a choice, which, again, makes me wonder what the lesson is supposed to be. It seems like a small change, but it kind of completely warps the context. Paul and Jessica were literally forced to assume their respective
respective roles lest they die, be it to the Fremen or to the greater galactic powers that are out to get them. So overall, though my film-loving brain was thoroughly stimulated, I got the exact same feeling as in the first one. Thoroughly engaging, beautiful build-up, completely dry orgasm at the end. Everything is expected, almost obligatory, partly because we had over two years to ponder these events and wait for the inevitable end, so it feels less like renovating your house in a daring, unexpected way, and more like the usual Saturday sweeping of the floors and ordering of the shelves. It's routine. I should elaborate on the positives, I suppose. I liked Paul's first confrontation with the sandworm. You know he's not gonna die, but it's so well executed and tense that it keeps you on edge pretty much the entire time. Kinda like when your dentist reaches into your mouth. Not that way, you degenerates. After assuring you for the third time that they pumped you full of anesthetic and you won't feel a thing, and you're like, we cool, right? And he's like, oh, we totally cool. Yet you still tense every muscle in your body despite not feeling a thing. Is that just me? I'm pretty sure that one's not just me. Timothy Shalom was born to play this role. I think even most of the haters will be silenced this time around, because what were tepid signs of life in part one are fully realized here as he manages to be cool, calm, collected, stoned, ponderous, empathetic, sympathetic, inspiring, unscrupulous, and very threatening as well. I don't think Dune fans could have asked for better casting or better performance. I poked fun about how Zendaya just stares at the camera in part one, but she's really good in this second part as well. Javier Bardem is as charismatic as ever, and he gets a lot more to play with this time around, though he kind of becomes a meme by the end. I'd say he's convinced of Paul's messianic status a little too easy. Even Shawnee, Paul's concubine who's intimately involved and implicitly supportive of him is more suspicious than a leading figure of the Fremen. But I suppose that's partly the point of the religious propaganda motif. Thanos has nothing to do, half the characters are in it for one scene, and the whole film, the whole two-part film, is an exercise in building massive quantities of anticipation followed by the most tepid, brief, summarily delivered payoffs. I just, they did it to me again. Unreal. There are two characters, for example, whose first meeting is hyped throughout the whole thing, yet when their encounter finally occurs, it is literally, hello, so-and-so, goodbye, so-and-so. That's it. The end. There's a scene I didn't understand where a supporting character stays behind for no adequately explored reason and gets captured for it. Before you get to ponder why, she's brutally executed by Rabbi What's-His-Face, which feels like a scene added in just because Rabbi Baldhead, Paul's main physical adversary, doesn't have much to do with himself for most of the film. That goes doubly so for the head of the leukemia patients, the Baron. Despite not being as talkative as in the book, I quite liked this version of the Baron and wanted to see more of him. I got to see less of him to the point where I feel like they needn't have bothered Skarsgård for part two and just AI'd him for the paltry few scenes he's in. Neither the Bene Gesserit nor the voice <laughs> ability had a satisfying payoff. Charlotte Rampling, despite her immense talent, had nothing to do, and Paul uses the voice, I think, once? Mostly for effect? Not really to overcome an obstacle or anything like that. It just registers like they didn't know what to do with this power that was otherwise hyped as a very important, very OP ability that would play some kind of a role in the future which it doesn't. The cinematography is great, better than in the first one. Not worth spending much time here. Everything visual is absolutely stunning, and the score, despite being more of the same as in part one, is as always brutally effective. One thing I did enjoy quite a bit is the vibe. The overall atmosphere, the creepy undertones of Paul's visions, the ancient, lived-in feeling of this universe, some of the trippier visuals reminiscent of older but golder sci-fi flicks, the voices, all of it is exactly what I've been missing from most modern films. Films that are too safe and dry and pretty and corporate to get down and dirty like raunchy slutty Dune does. So I might just go back and see it again for this feeling alone because at the end of the day I got two hours of really good film and 15 minutes of <sighs> So volume wise technically I got my money's worth. On a less flattering note this like its predecessor seems like an exercise in the art of sequel baiting. Which I know this is how the book ends more or less but I feel like the specifics of how it played out could have been manipulated to make the end point a little bit more satisfactory. Perhaps this proves more than anything else that this should not have been a part one and a part two. I stuck my neck out for this film. I defended it against the multitudes who despised it and called it overrated. And now I'm left feeling hollow, scorned, betrayed. I was so sure part two would wow me. Ironic. Even more so if most people end up liking it while I, in my grief, turn against it at the very end. Nah, only joking. I don't have enough emotion in me for that. It's a good film, it just might leave you feeling like you waited too long for too little. That is, if you're anything like me. And if you're anything like me, then... What is 
wrong with you? I can't believe how much this goes back to Villeneuve's usual bit of both praise and criticism that he gets. If you like films, if you love the experience for its own sake, if you appreciate the visuals, cinematography, scale, to experience the result of a thousand people's labor coming together into a synchronized chorus of movie magic, then you should see this film. If not, then after the credits roll, the two words that will come out of both your mouth and the mouths of most women in most bedrooms around the world will be... That's it?